The Gospel of Mark, where we left off last uh, Lord's Day morning, chapter number two, and your, uh, your bulletin should say, and there's also a sermon notes page that should say there, verses 18 down through verse number 22. So Mark's Gospel, chapter two, verses 18 down through verse number 22. And uh, another wonderful story, probably a familiar one, if you know the Gospel uh, somewhat, if you've read it recently, you'll know the story uh, of Jesus. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there is a sermon notes page in the bulletin that help you follow through. Uh, I encourage you to take some notes and uh, write some thoughts down. And for our kids, there's a little uh, kids notes page that was also uh, at the table as you walked in this morning. So Mark's Gospel, chapter 2 at verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why? Do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Jesus here again, uh, Mark 2, 18 to 22. Again, Jesus gets himself into hot water. Jesus again uh, gets himself into trouble for what he is saying and for what his disciples are doing, uh, his words and his deeds. Jesus gets himself into trouble with the religious authorities of the day, the Pharisees especially, this strict of the strict. Uh, the creme de la creme, the, uh, these are the, the, the holiest amongst the holy people, the Pharisees. And Jesus gets himself into hot water again and into trouble. And as I mentioned a couple of Sundays ago, as well as last week, uh, here in chapter 2 and then spilling to chapter 3, we have five little episodes that Mark uh, records for us. Here's the third, where Jesus intentionally gets himself into trouble with the Religious elites, the authorities, the scribes, the lawyers, the Pharisees, right? The elite of the elite amongst the people of God. Why? Because he wants to teach them the truth about himself and about his kingdom. He's the king and he's brought a kingdom with him, he said. Repent, believe, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's drawn near and he's the king of that amazing kingdom. So he gets himself into trouble here for his, not just his teaching, but the, the, the deeds, the acting of his disciples, they're following his teaching, they're feasting, they're not fasting. Why? Why? Uh, just as a quick, uh, uh, this, this, this reminds me, uh, here's Jesus getting himself into trouble, and he's been doing it now for a couple of episodes. Uh, it, it reminds me of what we see going on uh, in our culture and society today. Uh, many Christians are very outspoken today, saying that we should go out of our way as Christians and we as churches need to intentionally stir up some strife. You know, enough's enough, right? Six months is, is, is a long time for us to be cooped up and, and to shut down and not able to meet and so forth and, and all, have all these restrictions and, and regulations and burdens. And so, you know, we've got to go out of our way to get into trouble uh, so that we can get into court and, and we can have our, 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 our case adjudicated and so forth. Uh, you're not Jesus, brothers and sisters. Uh, you're not Jesus. Don't go looking for trouble. Uh, we're not the Son of God in human flesh. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Messiah. Uh, we are all not little Jesuses running around uh, the eternal wisdom and mind of God in human flesh. Amen? Okay? We're creatures. We are sinful, fallible, frail human beings. Paul tells us that we are to seek to live quiet and peaceable, godly lives, uh, to pray for the, the king and, the, and those in authority over us so that we might... Uh, be, uh, be good citizens, but we also might eventually uh, or, or ultimately be citizens of uh, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus can do this because he's Jesus. 
He's the son of God. He can go around stirring up a hornet's nest if he wants because why? He's God uh, in human flesh and you and I are not. Now he, he connects then, uh, he, uh, uh, he's connecting his teaching here with his kingdom uh, and he wants to correct misunderstandings uh, about fasting by saying that there is an appropriate time for fasting and there's an appropriate time for feasting. There's an appropriate time to feast when he's present. It's appropriate for, his, for us as his people not to fast when the Lord is present with us. That's what he was saying in the first century. And there will be a day to come, he says, when I'm no longer with my disciples. In that age, it will be appropriate when I'm absent to fast. So Jesus speaks here of a time for fasting, a time for feasting, and the appropriateness of of both. Notice, first of all, there's an inquisition here, uh, not the Spanish inquisition, not the Monty Python uh, Spanish inquisition, but there's an inquisition. There's a question here, right? Uh, you, as a preacher, you've got to have three points, and they've got to make sense. They've got to have uh, alliteration, sort of uh, a little bit of uh, rhyme and reason, so they all start with an I this morning, okay? Uh, an inquisition, a question. Now, John the Baptist, disciples, and the Pharisees, again, the strict of the strict amongst the Israelites, the leaders of the people of God, they were fasting. John's disciples are fasting. The Pharisees and their disciples are fasting, we read there. What's fasting? Just as we pause for a quick moment. What, what is fasting? No food, right? I would venture to guess if I was to pass that little sheet this morning and ask every one of you, uh, what is fasting? The first thing that pops in your mind is probably metafast. <laughs> Right? So there's, there's a whole business, there's a whole uh, economy around fasting, right? No food or a strict kind of food to lose weight. Uh, fasting is the opposite of feasting. Fasting is the opposite of feasting. And religiously, they're speaking here not of fasting for, you know, to cleanse your body and so forth. This is a religious fasting, a religious abstaining from food for a set period of time. Why? to humble your body and your soul so that you might then seek the help of God for some particular reason. Fasting helps us draw ourselves away from the needs of the world so that we might seek the face of God for our needs, to draw ourselves away from our worldly needs to seek our greatest need, which is God. And all throughout the Old Testament, we find fasting. As, as way back far as uh, 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 Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, they were to fast on that day, were the Israelites. One day a year, they were required to enter into a day of fasting and mourning for their sins, confessing their sins when the sacrifices were offered to show them that their sins were forgiven by sacrifice alone. Of course, pointing them all forward to the great once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus. We see fasting in the, in the, in the days of Saul and, and David and the kings fasting for all kinds of purposes and, and reasons. Uh, in particular, in, in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, just before the, the Israelites are going to return from Babylon back to the promised land, Ezra, the priest, tells them to fast, quote, to seek from the Lord a safe journey. So they fasted. They abstain from food for a set period of time so that they might pray to the Lord for a safe journey from Babylon all the way back to the promised land through uh, the, uh, the desert. In Nehemiah chapter number 9, for example, when they returned, Nehemiah then said again to call a fast. Why? So that they might confess their sins that they might humble themselves before God, confess the sins that led them there in the first place 70 years ago. So fasting to seek help for a safe journey, fasting to confess sins, for example. But turn in your Bible, if you have one in front of you, uh, or scroll in it on your device, whatever you have, uh, Isaiah 58, just for, a, uh, just for a moment or two. Isaiah 58, very key text in the Old Testament on fasting, uh, what it is, what it isn't. And Isaiah 58 uh, happens, or is being prophesied before Ezra and Nehemiah, before the return of to the promised land. Here's what the people of God were doing. Here's the reason why he sent them into exile. Isaiah 58. Uh, look at verse 3 and following. 
And here are the people of God. They're crying out to the Lord. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Right? They've humbled their bodies. They've abstained from food. Why? To seek God. We'll see, not quite, they're not really seeking God, but at least they're saying it. Why have we fasted and you don't see it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Right? God is not answering their prayers. Behold, in the day of your fast, here's what the Lord says, you seek your own pleasure, notice that, and oppress all your workers. In other words, they were fasting outwardly, but all the while, they weren't loving their neighbor as themselves. They were oppressive. They were uh, enslaving their employees, their workers. They were doing it for themselves. Not God's pleasure, but their own. Behold, verse 4, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. So they were fasting, but God wasn't going to listen because they were doing it with the wrong motives. Is such the fast that I chose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a, and, 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 uh, and a day acceptable to the Lord? So again, they were fasting for themselves to be seen, to be known as those who fasted, to, be, to, to have sackcloth on, to have basically like a burlap sack or a potato bag or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or one of those big heavy bags that we put coffee beans in and ship across the world. They wanted to be seen for wearing rough clothes, putting dirt upon their foreheads and so forth. Is this the kind of fast that I want? You're doing all the outward religious stuff all the while you're suppressing and oppressing your neighbor? Is this not the fast that I choose? Verse number six. To do the opposite. Notice. To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the straps of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Notice they are abstaining from food. Why? Not to store it up in their pantries for tomorrow, but to abstain from food to seek God's help and to use that food to feed the hungry. And so they're oppressing the hungry. When you see the naked to cover him, right? They're taking their clothes off, putting on this sackcloth and ashes, well, then take your clothes and give them to the needy. And not to hide yourself from your own flesh. If you do such things, verse 8 says, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily, and so forth. But no, they weren't doing it that way. That's Isaiah. That's 700 years before the coming of Jesus. In the days of Jesus, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 6 tells us, of course, you might know the story, with it, that they were praying and fasting to be seen. How were the Pharisees fasting in the first century when Jesus came? They were doing it to be known, to be seen. They put on their clothes. Uh, they looked hungry and emaciated. They made faces. Oh, I'm so hungry. I'm fasting. I'm so holy. What does Jesus say about that kind of a fast? To put on all the outward uh, clothing, uh, uh, to sort of slump over and to, and to grimace because your, 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 your hunger pains are kicking in, pangs are kicking in. What did Jesus say about that kind of a fast? And praying on the rooftops and, and praying on the street corners to be heard and seen. What did he say about that? What kind of a reward do they have? That's the reward. If you want to, be, if you want to fast and pray to be heard and seen by men, by people, well, then that's your reward. It's all you're going to get. But no, he says, go into your closet, close the door and pray, and then your Father in heaven will see. That's what's going on here. The disciples of John, the disciples of the, of, of the Pharisees, are fasting like the prophet had, 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 had denounced them for 700 years before. They're still doing the same thing. All to be seen, all to be known. And so that's, that's the context. People came then. Notice again, back to our text, Mark chapter 2, verse 18. People came and said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But yours don't. For a thousand years, God's people have fasted. To not fast is to stand out like a sore thumb. For a thousand years, we've been doing this. And now, all of a sudden, 
You, whom they say is the Messiah and they're following you, you don't, right? They stand out. They fast. Everyone else fasts. The disciples of John, very strict sect of the, of, the, of, of the Jews. The Pharisees, even stricter. They fast. Your disciples do not fast. In fact, Luke's gospel tells us in Luke 5.33, but yours, your disciples, eat and drink. John and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but your disciples eat and drink. They are feasting. Why? Why? So that's the Inquisition. That's the big question. Isn't it appropriate, as God has called us to do, to fast, but yours are feasting? Notice Jesus' answer. There are three little illustrations he gives to answer this question. Why they are eating and drinking. Why they are feasting and not fasting. Notice the first illustration is of a wedding. And who doesn't love a wedding, right? Verses 19 and 20. The first illustration is of a wedding. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Have you ever gone to a wedding that felt more like a funeral? It sounds like some of us have. I have. Uh, Karajin and I, way back in the day when we... uh, we're still, when I was still a seminary student, and we were in Iowa for a summer, and we got invited, I think in the same month or so, uh, to a wedding and to a funeral. Not in, in the congregation that we were serving in, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a local congregation that had extended family and friends and so forth, so we got invited. And, wow, the Dutch Reformed culture of Northwest Iowa, the wedding felt like a funeral and vice versa. It was really strange for us as Southern Californians to to go to a wedding that was just, it was oppressive and it was heavy handed and it was sort of dour and people sat in the, in the reception hall and, you know, their heads were down, you, they were eating from their, you know, their plastic spoons and their paper plates, right? It was just not a very festive atmosphere. When the bridegroom is with you, it should be a time of, fest- of festivity and, and feasting and joy. You go to a wedding, you expect to be there until midnight. You expect to get home late. You get a babysitter for your kids. You expect there to be good food and good drink and probably some good music and some funny things going on. You expect it to be happy, joyful, a beat. It's appropriate when the bridegroom is still here with his bride to be festive. It's not appropriate to be to, to, to fast. Who, who goes to a wedding to go afterwards to, to fast, to have just a cup of, cup of water without, without, without even an ice cube in it? Who goes to a wedding to fast? No one. No one. The days will come, though, Jesus says, notice, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. I'll come back to that little phrase in just a, in just a moment here. So in the illustration, who's the groom? Who's the groom, the bridegroom here? Jesus, right? The Messiah. Who's the bride? The disciples, right? All those who follow Jesus. In this case, the disciples, right? Those earliest followers of Jesus. Now, we've got to think of it like this, then. Think of it like this. uh, when, When the Lord comes, when God comes into human flesh and he enters our space, time, history, when God comes in Jesus Christ, in the gospel story, it's like the engagement party. The, the, the husband has come and he has betrothed to himself his bride. It's a time of festivity and joy and happiness. The announcements go out. Engagement. It's joyful. But then comes the ascension of Jesus. His death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God. And Jesus says, right, in those days, when he's taken away, it's appropriate to fast. And so he goes, as he tells us in the Gospel of John, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to set the table for the wedding. He's come and he's engaged himself to his people and it's joyful. He's left and we're sad because he's away from us. We feel the heartache and the loneliness. Uh, Absence makes the heart grow fonder, as we sometimes say. We feel that now after the ascension. Because he's gone to prepare a place for us and to set the table. When he comes again with glory, what's that great image of Revelation 19? It's the wedding festival, the wedding feast. 
of the Lamb. And so then, then the bridegroom will be taken away. Then they will fast in that day. But when he comes back, they will feast once again. So that's the first illustration. So why is it that John's disciples, the Pharisees' disciples, why they are fasting, or why are they fasting, and why are you just feasting? Because the husband has come, he's engaged himself to his bride at a time of joy. Notice, secondly, he gives an illustration of clothing. Verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. What's he saying here? What, why is he using this weird illustration, right? I mean, we, we, get a, we, we get a hole in our clothes. Our kids tear a hole. What do we do with our clothes? Goodwill, right? Goodwill them, right? Or maybe you might, we have a, we have a uh, in our laundry room, we have this cabinet, right, with old shirts, holes in them, worn out. I mean, you know, they're good for nothing. They're just good for dusting dirt uh, off of, off of uh, uh, furniture and so forth. Jesus is speaking of a different time and place, right? Uh, there's a piece of unshrunken cloth and it's put on an old garment that it's already been shrunk and so when you sew it on and then eventually you wash and it, you let it hang out to dry, uh, that new patch is going to also uh, shrink up. It's going to rip a hole even bigger. It's going to make the, the problem worse. What, what's he saying here? He's describing the old age and a new age to come. He's describing the age in which he is, which is an old age. He's not yet been raised from the dead, right? The new age is yet to dawn. And there's a day to come, an age to come. He's saying, I did not come. I did not come from heaven, the age that is to come. I didn't come from this new age, this new creation. I didn't come down to this old creation just to patch up, as it were, old clothes. I came to give new clothes to a people who are saved. By graves. I came to strip off their ripped holes, their moth, uh, uh, the, 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 these clothes that moths are eating and, and that are being torn apart and wearing out, that are fading. I came to take those clothes from you and to give you new clothes. The prophet Isaiah said it like this. I'll read, I'll read it again here. Uh, Isaiah 61, the prophet speaks of an age to come when there would be joy and new clothes for God's people who are wandering in the desert. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. Why? Because he's clothed me with the garments of salvation. They're wearing sackcloth and ashes. They're traveling across the deserts in chains to the king of Babylonia. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And then listen to this. As a bridegroom decks himself, right? as a bridegroom dresses up for his wedding, like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, that's how the Lord is going to clothe his people. Didn't he just describe himself as a bridegroom? The prophet said when the, when the bridegroom comes, he's going to dress his people, clothe them with appropriate clothing for an age of joy and an age of feasting, it's not time to fast, he's saying. Notice thirdly, this illustration from wine. Uh, verse number 22. No one, again, it's a similar image, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, right? Because they, they have shrunk uh, uh, over, over time. They've been exposed to the elements, and so the, the leather wineskins, uh, they, they shrink up. Uh, if you put new wine that's yet to be fermented... Into old wineskins, the wine will burst the skins. And the wine is destroyed. It spills out. And so the skins are also destroyed. But the new wine is for fresh, fresh wineskins. Again, what's he saying here? This is really strange to us. I mean, we might, we might get through the vino, uh, you know, uh, illustration here. But, but why? What's he trying to say to us? Again, he's describing that when, when the, uh, the prophets described that when the Messiah would come, when the Lord would come from heaven to earth, he was bringing with him heaven. He was bringing a new creation, a new age that was going to dawn on this earth. And when he does so, he's going to replace the old. And interestingly, wine is an image of new creation, of joy, of peace, of Prosperity of all the blessings of God. Uh, turn quickly with me to the, to, the, to, to the prophet Joel, so the minor prophets, 
Just going to read two verses with you. Joel chapter number 3. Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 3, uh, verse number 18. The very end of this little prophecy. He says this. He's speaking of an age to come. Whenever the prophets say something like this in Joel 3.18, in that day, they're speaking of the age of the Messiah, the age of the coming of the Lord. In that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine. Right? Not spoiled, not bad wine. Sweet wine. And the hills shall flow with milk. And all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. When God promised the Israelites that they were going to enter the promised land, how do you describe it again? A land that flowed with what? Milk and honey, right? Images of joy and blessing and prosperity and abundance and God's love and his care for his people. The prophet says there's an age to come. There's an age to come. The hills are going to flow with milk. There's going to be a stream of water flowing throughout the land. And the mountains themselves are going to, amazingly, he describes it, drip down with sweet wine. It's an age of heaven. It's an age of blessing. It's an age of salvation. It's an age of joy, he says. When the Lord comes, it's an age of feasting and drinking and joy. Notice also Amos, the very next prophet, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos chapter number 9, uh, verse 13. Amos 9, verse 13. Again, notice he says this, Behold, the days are coming. It's another way the prophets described the Messiah's age. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and so forth. Why don't your disciples fast like everyone else? Why can't they just get in line and do the right thing? Why do your followers act so strange? Why do they act so happy? Why do they act so joyful? You should be, a t- you should be fasting in sackcloth and ashes. The Roman Empire is, is oppressing us. Sackcloth and ashes. Jesus says, it's because the Lord has come. I have come and I've brought my kingdom. It's an age of joy. It's an age of blessing. It's not appropriate when the Lord is with his people to fast. It's appropriate to feast. And so he's giving to the disciples, and he's answering the question by saying that I've brought a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth has come down with me, and it's here. But we know that the Lord has ascended back into heaven, and so we long for the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. The gospel stories give us a preview of what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. Joy, feasting, fellowship, the presence of God with us, living and loving God in his presence forever and ever. The gospel stories, the miracles I've mentioned And even the illustrations here are previews of the coming age for us as we long for that day to come, as we lift up our eyes and our hearts to him. So there's a question here. There's an an inquisition here. Why don't your disciples fast? He gives three illustrations. It's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. It's like a wedding. It's like the new clothes. It's like the wine. They can't, right? He even says that. They cannot. They cannot fast. What does this mean for us? What's the instruction for us? Let us back in verse 20 again. So what about fasting? Then, he says, when the groom leaves, then they will fast in that day. He's speaking of the day in which he ascends. While I'm present, we feast. While I'm absent, you fast. Is it still appropriate for us, or is it appropriate for us as Christians who know the joy of the Lord, who, 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 who know the, the beginnings in our own heart of everlasting life, is it appropriate for us in this age to fast, to f- abstain religiously for, from food for a set period of time so that our bodies might be humbled, so that we might lift our souls to God in prayer to find help in our time of need, whatever that need might be? Is it appropriate for us to fast? The answer is yes. 
Jesus says so. Then they will fast. But I want you to see something about this. Notice that we learn from this some instruction. Just a couple of quick little mini points for you to write down or think about. Does Jesus give her any rules for fasting? No. Then they will fast. He gives no rules. He just says then, right? Then they will fast. So in other words, you and I are free. We are free to fast in this age between the ascension of Jesus and the coming of Jesus. We are free to fast in this age. So we are to do so freely. Secondly, we are to do so cheerfully. Why? He's, a, he's away from us. It would seem like we should be dour and sad. No, the Lord has come and we know that. We, his Holy Spirit is within our heart. He's poured out his love into us because of the Holy Spirit. And so now we are joyful. We know what it is to have everlasting life. We are longing and waiting for the fullness of it to come. And so if we fast in this age freely, we should also do so cheerfully. Cheerfully. We don't do it like the Pharisees, right? Sackcloth and ashes. We don't, we, we shouldn't, you shouldn't go out on Facebook tomorrow or Twitter or Instagram, whatever, and, 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 and selfie yourself uh, with sackcloth and ashes. With no makeup, women or, or men. Maybe you're, you're, you know, wake up with a pillow hat or whatever. Okay? Don't make a point of parading your righteousness, right? We do so because it's between us and the Lord. Now, there are times in which we as church even have, uh, as I've preached through the, the word and we've come to texts like this, there's times for us as pastor and elders to say, hey, people of God, we should fast because we got big things, to, right? We should fast and pray for, for example, our country, the election. Well, we, we can fast and pray when there's some kind of a tragedy that it happens. We can fast and pray uh, if we are seeking God's face. We have, say, uh, some, some uh, decision to make for calling a missionary or, or an elder or a deacon to serve the body or something like that. There are times in which we can all do it together, but there's also times for us to do it cheerfully on our own. And just thirdly to say this. If we fast, when we fast, do it freely and do it cheerfully, do it zealously, right? Do it zealously. Don't do it out of custom or habit or tradition. Do it with zeal, right? With passion. I am humbling my body for whatever time it might be so that I might focus my heart on praying, seeking the face of God. It might just be one meal. It might be a day. It might be who knows how long it might be. You might have in your mind a set period of time that you vow to God. God, I'm going to abstain for the next 24 hours so that I might focus my mind even as I'm working on prayer. And when I'm free uh, from work, that I might pray uh, more devotedly, more zealously to you for this particular thing that I'm, I'm looking for help. Is it appropriate for us to fast in this age? Yes. Do it freely. Do it cheerfully. Do it zealously. One, uh, one of my favorite old, old writers once said it like this. It's a sad, uh, uh, it is sad, a sign of great decay in the church. And he said this back in the 1700s, so think about today. That so little work is made of fasting. Therefore, all who wish to lead a life of tender godliness and desire to see the good of Zion, the church, ought to stir themselves up to exercise this duty of fasting. Do not allow the practice to die out. Do not allow the practice to die out. It's an aid for us. Fasting is an aid for us in seeking Jesus' help in our time of need so that we might more devotedly, more zealously pray, hallowed be thy name, that he would be glorified in our lives, so that we might pray, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we might show thankfulness for our daily bread. That we might be enabled by God. God, there's a thorn in my side. I cannot forgive him. I cannot forgive her. God, I want to vow to you that I'm going to abstain, to pray that I might forgive those who have trespassed against me. So that we might resist temptation all to the glory and to the honor of the Lord. And so Jesus got himself into trouble here. But he gets out of it. Why? Because he's the Messiah. The age of the Messiah has come. It was then a time of feasting. Now it's a time for fasting. There's an age coming, loved ones. There is an age coming when fasting will no longer be needed. 
or appropriate because we will see the Lord face to face. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He's going to have a table for us in the presence of our enemies, as the psalm says, to bless us for eternity, day and night, day and night, never ceasing to praise our wonderful Savior. Let's pray.